Uh, and I'm sorry that that can't happen, but um, uh, it seems like that's not happening for anyone right now. So I guess this is uh, the best that we can all do. So yes, I think that what I'm gonna say is pretty controversial. Uh, and that's why I've given, we've got the title, um, which might come across as a bit dismissive, uh, objective morality, who cares? And really, if there's one take home that I want you to have from what I have to say, and what I think about morality, it's like, it might be cool if morality were objective. I'm not sure it would be cool, but maybe. But we shouldn't really care that much. It's really easy to get preoccupied by the idea of like, oh, is it all really objective? Is, are there moral facts out there? But actually, I think that that's a bit of a mistake. and We shouldn't really worry about it. So I think one way of starting with this is to think about what a lot of religious people think. So lots of people think that if it turns out that there's not a God, then that would like undermine morality. This idea you know, that there are some things that we ought to do and some things that we ought not to do, that idea would um, be, it would be baseless. It would be like debunked. It would be superstition, just like prayer and sin and all the rest, if it turns out that there's no God. So on their view, Moral, moral rules need to come from God in order to really matter. Or we might say, in order to have authority or legitimacy to govern our lives. And there's a really nice uh, summary of this. So Ivan, who's a character in Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov, which some of you may have read. It's, uh, it's very long on the one hand, but it's also a genuinely philosophical novel. So that's the reason to read it. Uh, and he kind of gives voice to this idea. He has this line when he says that, you know, if God is dead, then all things are permitted. So like, there's no right or wrong, not, no things that are in, not permitted and permitted. You know, it's all, it's all just the same. So why would someone think that? So why would the existence of a God give ethical principles, you know, the norms that govern our lives, tell us how to treat each other, some kind of significance? or importance that they would lack otherwise? Well, one answer to that is to say, if God exists, then morality is objective. And if God doesn't exist, then morality is not objective. And to say also that morality only really matters if it's objective. So we can summarize that view as being like two claims. So claim one, Morality is only objective if God exists. So, sorry, morality is objective if and only if God exists. So, like, only, only objectivity if God. And then premise two is to say that morality is only authoritative if it's objective. So, you know, only significant if objective. Now, I think many, um, if not most, contemporary philosophers reject this idea. Uh, they disagree with Ivan's statement. They think that morality can matter or, or can have authority to govern our lives, even if there isn't a God. But they have different approaches when it comes to explaining why that's true. And they correspond to the two different strands of the argument, the two different premises that I explained above. So most contemporary philosophers, maybe not most, but a lot of contemporary philosophers are going to reject premise one. So they hold out hope that morality could be objective, even if there's not a God. And they've got various kinds of complicated stories to explain how that might be. But what really interests me is that these philosophers generally accept premise two. So they agree that morality is only authoritative if it's objective. So they say, no, it doesn't need a God to be objective, but yes, it does need to be objective to be authoritative. In fact, they often say that anyone who denies that morality is objective must be a kind of nihilist. So Derek, the philosopher Derek Parfit that you might have come across says that anyone who has the kind of non-objectivist view that I'm attracted to, um, and which I'm going to explain a bit more, um, we think that nothing really matters. That's the world that we believe in. And of course, I think that this is a big mistake. I think that things do matter, even if they don't matter objectively, or even if morality is not objective. I think that this obsession with objectivity 
is still giving too much to the religious worldview. So maybe the philosophers, these philosophers are right about premise one. Maybe morality could be objective without a God, but we don't need it to be objective. And actually, I think the stories that they tell about how morality might be objective are pretty implausible. They involve speculations about metaphysics, about epistemology, about rationality, and about the future of moral thought that I don't think are very likely to be true. Because I think the most likely story is that morality is something that was invented by our distant ancestors and has been changed over time to answer to the sort of ongoing, evolving concerns and interests of human beings. Morality is, in that sense, up to us. And it has the shape it has because of the kinds of creatures that we just happen to be. In that view, morality isn't objective, not in any kind of philosophically heavy duty sense. But I think we shouldn't really care. We shouldn't worry about that. We should reject premise two. Morality would be authoritative even if not objective. Morality matters. It has a kind of authority over us, not because it's written up in the sky or like in the book of the world or in the laws of, of, of creation or whatever, but for a much more simpler, simple reason. Morality matters because moral norms offer solutions to the practical problems that are faced by creatures like us, creatures whose lives are given structure by the kinds of feelings that we have that are pro-social. We, we have feelings and emotion like empathy and benevolence. We care for each other. We have problems living together and morality helps us to answer those problems. Because my view focuses on practical problems, it's called a pragmatist view. And because I see feelings as central to morality, this can be called a sentimentalist view. Uh, and that's sort of a, maybe a misleading word. Sentimentalist can sound like uh, saying, I'm really, really sentimental. <laughs> but that's not really what I'm saying. I'm saying that morality arises from our emotions in part. And what I'm gonna to do today is I'm not gonna give you a big story about that kind of view. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it, but what I want to say is, just, is this is a non-objective picture of morality and I want to show, or I want to kind of convince you that morality could matter even if it's not objective. So why, why objectivity? Uh, the philosopher Thomas Nagel, uh, in his book, The View from Nowhere, I don't know if any of you've come across it, but it's one of the best books written in philosophy in the 20th century. I think a lot of it is wrong, by the way. <laughs> I think it's like overwhelmingly wrong about lots of things, uh, and not just like specific things, but about the whole picture of philosophy and the world that it offers. But it's a lovely book. It's, a, it's short, it's, it's, it's weirdly accessible, even though it's not written as an introduction. Uh, and it has like a comprehensive picture of the world. And I think that's a really fun thing to read. Um, and he starts his chapter on ethics with this, the following words. He says, um, objectivity is the central pro problem of ethics, not just in theory, but in life. So his thought is, if morality turned out not to be objective, then it would lack some kind of special authority, some special significance. And, and that's central to making sense of the role that morality plays in our lives. So this is the view that I've mentioned above. Like, you need objectivity to get the significance of morality. And, and here's a really famous philosopher, Thomas Nagel, saying it, there's the first line he writes about ethics. So why, why would we think that? What is so special about objectivity? Why should we insist that morality needs to be objective in order to play this central role in governing our lives? Well, we could go different ways here. Objectivists could just sort of stamp their feet and insist that ethics has got to be objective to matter without offering any kind of reason. But I think, I hope you'll agree with me that this isn't a very compelling approach. The best answer is going to be to show that morality, so that um, objectivity gives us some feature that we can see morality needs to have in order to be authoritative in our lives. And so my strategy for engaging with this kind of response has got, a, got two prongs. So on the one hand, we can think of some features that morality only would have if it was genuinely kind of hardcore objective. 
But I think that these are features that it might be nice if morality had them. I'm going to explain what they are. But they're not the sorts of things we think, oh, well, unless morality is like this, then it's all bunk. They're like, oh, that would be cool. But it's not like central. On the other hand, there are some features that I think we can agree really are central. Morality really does need to be like this in order for us not to think of it all as just some kind of superstition. But these are going to be features that I think morality doesn't have to be objective to have them. So we end up with the idea that moral objectivism kind of rests on a mistake, like a confusion between two different things. The things that would be nice and are really closely connected to objectivity, but which aren't really necessary. And the things that really are necessary, but aren't really connected to objectivity. So let's start with the first group of things, things that are really closely connected to various kinds of objective moral theory. But, um, oh yeah, thanks Hamish for that. Um, uh, but aren't really vital for us to think that morality matters to us. And we can start with this thought. It's a really depressing thought, which is lots of people seem quite happy to do terrible things. Often they appear to act quite deliberately and clear-headedly when they do this and they don't feel any remorse. Sometimes they don't seem to suffer any consequences. And that fact can kind of undermine our faith in morality. When we're faced with that, it would be kind of nice if, we, if, if philosophy had a response, right? if it could do something to, to ward off this, the despair that can arise when we see all these people quite calmly, sanely, apparently um, doing terrible things with no remorse and no consequences. We want to show that there's a, that we want a philosophical argument to sort of say, oh, this isn't, it's not really so bad. Um, so here's one thing that might be nice. It might be nice if we could kind of convince ourselves that moral laws were really somehow as unbreakable as the laws of nature. And in, in history, actually, this is something that some moral objectivists have tried to argue. Um, Plato thought that the good was also the real, that when we act immor immorally, we're, we're kind of blocking ourselves from true reality. And we're condemning ourselves to live in a kind of metaphysically second-rate world of mere appearance. So when we are bad, we are disconnected from genuine reality, right? And that's something kind of nice about that thought, I think, perhaps for some people. And, and some religious thinkers have had the same view. They say that evil alienates us from the reality of the divine, and it leaves us stranded in the material world, which is actually an illusion. But I don't think that many of us can really think like this anymore. Like, this is the real world, the one we're in. And, and moral wrongdoing is a part of it. Moral wrongdoing is real. It's part of reality. It's not just an illusion. Even if morality is part of the real world and being immoral doesn't separate us from reality, it might be reassuring if wicked people always sort of had their comeuppance, um, if they always got punished for their bad deeds, and perhaps if good people always got a reward. And again, this is a thing that many religious people have thought, that there are you know, punishments and rewards in the afterlife. And it's something that has appealed to lots of philosophers of a kind of objectivist moral kind of um, viewpoint. So actually uh, Kant thought that this was a reason to be religious because it's just too awful to contemplate a world where terrible people prosper without being punished. But I think again, we just have to like be reconciled to the possibility that this ain't the case. Maybe the good won't get rewarded and the bad won't get punished. Bishop Butler, uh, another philosopher that I really like, um, says we, we shouldn't confuse power with authority. Maybe morality doesn't have the power to you know, punish us and reward us, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have the authority in the sense of you know, we should obey it. And just because we can't kind of cajole a selfish agent to be good, that doesn't mean that there isn't such a thing as good and bad. If we've got to admit that wickedness is real and often goes unpunished, then lots of 
objectivists to kind of get really troubled then by, by the existence of immoral people. And so they want to say, well, even if they're not going to get punished, even if we can't motivate them through selfishness to do better, even if they are in one sense living in the real world, we can still demonstrate to them that they're making some kind of mistake. You know, perhaps they can act badly without remorse, but if they are clear eyed in the way that I mentioned earlier, if they are rational, then they, they, they have to acknowledge they're making a mistake. Um, Simon Blackburn says that these philosophers um, retain an, a wish that the knaves of the world can not only be confined and confounded, but refuted and refuted as well by standards that they have to acknowledge. Sorry, you probably haven't heard Simon Blackman's voice, but he does speak like that. <laughs> um, so in other words, like the idea is, the hope is that morality is something that we can just demonstrate in a way that could convince any rational person. But then Blackburn goes on um, that this wish is still tantalizingly there as a goal or ideal, the holy grail of moral philosophy. And many suppose that all right thinking people must join the pilgrimage to find it. But we sentimentalists do not like our good behavior to be hostage to such a search. We don't altogether approve of holy grails. We do not see the need for them. And I think he's right. It, it would certainly be nice if we had some like, if philosophy gave us sort of special arguments where we could convince terrible people that they, they're doing something wrong, they're making a mistake, um, just so long as they're rational. Um, and I think it's probably right that philosophy could only do that if morality were objective. But the question is, do we need that? Do we need there to be this sort of special argument in order for us to think, yeah, morality makes sense, it's objective, we should, we should do moral things? And I think this is sort of the key of the debate between objectivists and anti-objectivists. I think that we should leave this hope for like this special power of demonstration to convince the wicked. We should think of it a bit like the kind of hope that we had that oh, earlier that we've already abandoned, the hope that there's going to be a punishment um, in the afterlife or the hope that morality is connected with like true reality as opposed to illusion. You know, that it's sort of maybe something that would be nice if it were true, but it's not something that we and, and by we, I mean us, like people who are not immoral or amoral or wicked, I hope. Maybe you are, in which case you don't count as being part of the we that I'm talking about, um, that we should need in order to see morality as authoritative. Um, so to echo Blackburn's line, why should we hold our commitment to morality hostage to what might or might not convince terrible people? That said, I don't want to deny that there are big and important questions which confront us when we consider the role that ethics has in our lives. Um, and, and that we have to ask um, whether ethic, ethical norms are really authoritative and legitimate. I, I do think these are real questions, right? I think there is like a role for theorizing about ethics and asking difficult questions about ethics. You know, we need to know that our ethical judgments aren't just arbitrary prejudices. There is some principal difference between good and bad. And we want to be assured that when we do, when we choose to do what we call right, um, and sometimes you know, doing what's right will come at the expense of ourselves and our loved ones. We want to know that when we do that, we're not just being sort of cultists or rule worshippers who are like slavishly obeying some like silly um, kind of cult rules that, that, that don't actually serve any good end. So it's not a given. It's not a given for me that ethics is authoritative or legitimate. We do face difficult questions. It takes an argument to vindicate ethics. But what I want to say is that providing this vindication doesn't have to involve claiming that ethics is objective. So here's the outline of a vindicatory story. So on this story, human beings are creatures that have certain kinds of pro-social drives. We have capacities for sympathy, empathy, benevolence, altruism. We also want to live together in societies. We're not completely kind of loner animals. We're social animals. But when we try to live together in societies, especially the societies on the scale of the societies that we now live in today, we face problems. We get, we get into disagreements, sometimes even fights, 
fallings out. Social life isn't easy for, for, for us. And so we have invented a system of norms to allow us to overcome the problems that we face as mutually concerned individuals that care about each other, that care about living together, the problems that we face in living together. And ethics, ethical inquiry, is this ongoing process of trying to find solutions to the ever-changing problems that mutually sy sympathetic animals like us find in our social lives together. And this might sound like, this isn't even really philosophy, this is sort of so straightforward. Um, it's, but this, I think this is a really, this is basically, you know, this is a kind of toy story. It's a brief picture, it doesn't have a lot of details. It's based on the work of um, the philosopher Philip Kitcher um, at Columbia University, who in turn is inspired by the pragmatism of the American philosopher John Dewey and the sentimentalist theory of moral emotions that stretches back to um, your hometown hero, uh, Adam Smith uh, and David Hume. Um, just to, uh, and this, this, this Scotland must have like per capita more great philosophers in history than like anywhere else. <laughs> um, I love Smith and Hume. Um, and, and, and another really important feature of this story is that it's totally compatible with the best understanding that we have of the, of the natural history of moral thinking in humans, of how morality evolved in our kind of, in the history of the human species. It doesn't require any wild metaphysical or philosophical speculation. And this connection to the scientific worldview means that this is a view that we can call naturalistic. You may, may have come across this term, but it's a naturalistic theory. It doesn't require anything that goes beyond a scientific picture of the world. And I'm not saying that this is the only way to vindicate the authority of morality. I'm just saying that it's one way. Because look, if this picture is right, then ethics isn't arbitrary. There's a difference between getting it right and getting it wrong in ethics. A moral norm, a moral innovation, either does or does not help to solve the problems which it was invented to address. And moral motivation isn't just rule worship. It's not like a cultish thing. Morality really does something that's useful for us. If moral norms are the solution to the problems that we as mutually sympathetic creatures find in living together, then we can sort of see, we can feel how it makes sense to grant morality the standing to govern our lives. But this is a story in which morality is not objective in any accepted philosophical sense. Because as I said, on this story, moral norms are in invented. They're invented to address the needs that members of a particular species happen to have as a result of their psychological makeup. And in fact, moral norms, as I, on this picture, aren't final. That isn't a final answer in ethics. These are things that we're constantly innovating and revising and changing as our lives and as our social world changes. So what I've argued is that morality can be authoritative. It can play the role that we need it to play in our lives without being objective. There's the stuff it, we need, right? To show that morality is not arbitrary, that it's not rule worship. That's not connected to objectivity. There was a bunch of stuff that seemed to be objective to objectivity, so connected to objectivity, but I was saying, yeah, we don't really need that. That's just stuff that would be nice. But, you know, as I said, this is a super controversial view. Lots of philosophers deny it. They say that morality must be objective in order to deserve the role, you know, to, in order for us to say, yeah, morality matters. We ought to do what morality says. It, it's authoritative over us. So why do they think that? So in order to address that problem, we need to look in a bit more detail at a few objectivist theories. I'm gonna briefly talk us through some of those. So one objectivist moral theory is called robust realism or non-naturalist realism. So David Enoch is a philosopher who has that view. Uh, so on this view, the naturalistic worldview of the natural sciences is radically incomplete. As well as all the natural scientific facts and properties and objects in the world that the scientists talk about, there's like another metaphysical layer of stuff. There are special moral facts and special moral properties. And these moral facts are totally independent of what humans happen to think. They're not invented. They're just out there like rocks and planets and oceans whether or not anyone happens to acknowledge them. 
The difference between moral facts and rocks, parts, and oceans is that we don't discover them empirically. And they don't enter into the kinds of causal relationships that all the other things that the natural sciences deal with enter into, but they're still out there. And we get things right in ethics when our views correspond to the facts. So in this view, moral objectivity is the objectivity of like stuff, stuff that just exists. And this does seem to offer us black, this holy grail that Blackburn mentioned, you know, an argument that demonstrates to wicked people that they're wrong. Um, in this sense, immoral people are just making a mistake about what exists. You know, if they knew what was out there, they would see, oh, you know, there are moral facts. Okay, I guess I'm wrong. Um, you know, they weren't looking carefully enough. But in a way, though, I don't think it offers us the kind of answer that we really want. So uh, Shamik Desgupta says, um, why, at the end of the day, should we care about what this special metaphysical reality tells us to do? How does positing additional entities, additional stuff, help us to vindicate the authority of morality. You know, what's missing in the account that I sketched before, you know, this account, you know, of, you know morality is this kind of human invention. I and mean, when I said that account does vindicate the authority of morality, how is that account made any better just by positing extra stuff? I think it's hard to see why living an ethical life makes any more sense just because there's an extra special metaphysical layer of ent entities and properties out there. And actually, for this kind of reason, some philosophers who also call themselves um, non-naturalist realists actually deny that their chief concern is about what exists. Um, Derek Parfit, Thomas Nagel, and TM Scanlon are in this group. And they say that, yeah, morality is objective, but not in the sense of involving extra stuff. Actually, it's about something else. Well, what do they mean? I think it helps to back up a bit here. So my story, I said, shows that in one sense, morality is not arbitrary. Um, there is a fact of the matter as to whether moral norms actually solve our problems. And moral norms, and these problems you know, are aimed at goals that do seem valuable to us. But there is a kind of room for worry. You know, why designate these, why do we, why do we take these problems to be problems? Why do we care about these problems? You know, the goals that these problems are aimed at, how can we be so sure that these goals really are valuable? So perhaps our judgment here simply represents, reflects our psychological quirks or worse, prejudices, right? So maybe you know, when we say, oh, morality is good because it helps us live together, that's just reflecting various prejudices that we have as human beings. And that's the, um, that's the worry these philosophers have. And the particularity of our viewpoint is sort of biasing our assessment of what problems are worth solving. So when they say that morality is objective, they're not making a claim about stuff, they're making a claim about perspectives. So uh, Tom Nagel says that a fact is um, perspectively objective when it appears from a viewpoint that's formed by progressively moving away from like the local viewpoints that all of us have in order to approximate what he calls the view from nowhere. So it's a view that's like stripped of all the kind of contingencies and particularities of our individual perspectives and even more than that, of our human perspective. So when he says that morality is objective, he means that morality is something that even if you were looking at the world from a, a viewpoint that was sort of totally unlike the one that is distinctive to humans, you would still see, oh, look, there are still moral truths. And again, this picture provides Blackburn's holy grail. When we tell, we can say to our moral people, look, if you just stood back and were more objective, you would see that there were moral facts. But I want to respond, do moral facts, moral problems really need to seem significant when viewed from nowhere in order for us to think that there are authoritative? I mean, look, maybe maybe they do. Maybe if we viewed the world from nowhere, then we would think there were moral facts. I don't know. I've never occupied the view from nowhere. And I want to say, even if morality is the sort of thing that only seems significant, that only seems salient, that's only even perceptible for creatures that are equipped with this, or the whole range of human feelings of human psychology and emotions, 
then it would be a kind of contempt to say, a contempt for humanity to say, oh, in that case, because morality is only something that appears to creatures with human feelings, in that case, it's kind of debunked or second best. Why do we have to insist that morality uh, is only authoritative if it's connected to this inhuman perspective? Another kind of conception of objectivity attempts to address the problem of prejudice by appealing not to um, the view from nowhere, but the view of the rational agent. So this is a view that uh, Kantian constructivists like Christine Korsgaard have. On their view, the morality is all about the problems that any rational being as such would necessarily face in the exercise of her practical agency. And again, what I want to say is maybe, maybe there are problems that all rational agents necessarily face. And maybe those problems are connected to the sorts of things that we think of as being ethical. And if that were true, then we could again respond to the irrational person. We could say, look, sorry, the immoral person. We could respond to the immoral person and say, if you just thought about this more rationally, then you would see what kind of mistake you were making. But it doesn't strike me as obvious that there are problems that any rational agent has to face. And it doesn't strike me as, as obvious that if there were problems like this, they would have anything to do with what we call morality. And what I want to say is again, why say that morality would be not authoritative for us just because there might be rational agents who are uninterested in morality, rational aliens or robots who just couldn't be got to thought, got to think morally. And even if some aspects of ethics do seem really connected to the notion of the rational agent, it also seems open to me that there might be certain aspects of ethics that really don't, aren't closely connected to rationality as such, and that are more connected to a more specific and engaged point of view. So let's imagine two agents, both of them are rational, but only one of them feels love. So perhaps maybe both of them agree to some really general ethical principles of the sort that Kant would like, but only one of them feels the tug of like special duties of what we call partiality towards loved ones. Does this fact provide any argument that special duties to loved ones or to family are like not authoritative because not all rational beings feel them? Should, are we gonna say that the agent who feels love is actually blinded by prejudice? Not a, I don't think so, not at all. I think if we said that, then we've moved from wanting to avoid prejudice and wanting to avoid bias to trying to rid ourselves of everything that makes us human. The fact that some moral concerns are very tied to the particularities of your human psychology doesn't undermine them as far as I can see. Here's a final thing that some people think morality needs to have. So far, we were talking about disagreements between moral people and immoral people and what the moral people can say to the immoral people. But what about disagreements between people who are sort of trying to be moral and do care about being good? That can worry us too. The philosopher Michael Smith says, our preoccupation with moral argument only makes sense if we assume that there's a kind of convergence point. He says that, you know, we have to hope that if we were open-minded and we thought carefully and assessed everything um, fairly, then we'd all converge upon the same moral views. So as he says, the term objective here simply signifies the possibility of a convergence in moral views. And he thinks that we, our commitment to morality is hinged upon the hope that we'll all reach consensus eventually. But I don't think that the authority of morality really is dependent on this. I think we can perfectly well make sense of the idea that moral problems could admit of a variety of equally good but different and incompatible solutions. Maybe there are different sets of moral norms that are all good in their own way, but they're not compatible and we can't accept all of them at the same time. And maybe the future of human social life 
is such that we're constantly going to be getting new problems that are quite unlike those that have gone in the past. So we're always going to be having to revise and reconsider our ethical views. And I think these aren't pictures in which we say, oh, in that case, we lose our commitment to morality. So I've tried to sort of say, look, here are these pictures of, morale, of objectivity. They all seem to perhaps offer something interesting, but you know, they don't point to any one feature that we're like, yes, if morality doesn't have that, then it's all bunk or it's not authoritative. But here's like an argument that has moved some people saying, well, morality needs to be objective in at least one of these senses. And what I've dismissed as the Holy Grail is actually really vital. So let's return to the case of the immoral agent. Even if we can't convince her, right? So I was saying, these people want to be able to convince every immoral agent. We shouldn't care so much about convincing the immoral agent. But I do admit that we do want to condemn the immoral agent. And here's the argument. Look, you can only condemn an agent for her actions if she has reasons against them. But if ethics derives from sympathy or altruism, then we might worry that history's very worst villains were just constitutionally incapable of seeing that they're doing wrong. If these people cannot grasp moral reasons, if, we, if it's just impossible to persuade them, then how can we say that they ought to follow moral reasons? On the other hand, if morality is objective, then there is always a sense in which moral reasons are available to villains. You know, if only they would adopt the view from nowhere, if only they would exercise pure reason, then they could see what they ought to do. And because it's possible for them to see what we ought to do, that's why we get to condemn them. And I think that's, a, that's a, an interesting argument and there's something right about it, but I don't think it supports objectivism. Because I think there are two kinds of moral criticism. Sometimes when we say we criticize other people, we're doing that in a way that's really tied to persuasion. But at other times when we criticize someone, we're not thinking about ways that they could be got to act better. We're just saying that these people are degenerates and they're, they're terrible people and we're marking them out and we're trying to kind of marshal the forces of good against them. And when an agent is, when a person is considered totally unredeemable, then actually in normal life, people will often talk about how revolting he is, but we don't normally talk about the reasons we have. he has. And here's an example that might seem very salient to you. Lots of progressives think that Donald Trump is totally unredeemable, that he's so egotistical and cruel that he can't be brought to care about ethics. So it's very rare to hear progressives say that, more, that Trump has a reason to be more tolerant or enact more just policies. They just condemn him. No one assumes that moral condemnation of Trump is rests upon the assumption that Trump is capable of appreciating moral reasons. We just, we know he's not, or progressives know he's not, and they condemn him nonetheless. And I think that brings us to an important point, and it's my final point. As I said, we here who are asking about the authority of morality are, I hope, not monsters. I think it would be kind of petulant for us to say, oh, well, morality is only gets to tell us what to do if it also has this role in the lives of terrible people. Why should we care so much about what can be said to the immoralist and what can be thought by the immoralist? Why should we say that our lives and our commitment to morality is contingent on that? Even if Trump has no reason in the sense of a reason that he can act on to be moral, even if the immoralist can't be persuaded to act better, why would that absolve me of the duty to care about my fellow humans? So I think that Blackburn's right. We shouldn't hold our moral ambitions hostage to the objectivist holy grail, even if morality is not objective, even if it's not out there, even if we're not all fated to reach consensus, even if it's not grounded in pure reason, we should still grant ethics the authority to govern our lives, even if it can't persuade Trump or offer him a reason. Thanks a lot.
Thank you so much, Max. That was an unbelievable talk. I enjoyed it so much. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, if you have questions for Max, we're now going to do a QA. and a I'm going to stop recording. Right, Sabina, we stop recording? Um, yeah, we normally also do like a quick break, but you're right. You Max, you deserve a break. All right. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to break for five minutes and <clears throat> we will come back. I mean, yeah, let's just break for seven minutes. We'll come back at 25 past. Yeah. Right, I'll see you then. Brilliant. And you can finish the recording, I think.